Police and law enforcement agencies are always looking for new techniques to help them solve crime. One of these fields is geographic profiling, which was first developed by a Canadian criminologist named Dr. Kim Rosmo while he was working in the Vancouver Police Department during the 1980s. It's a tool that processes information about a particular offender and uses a mathematical algorithm to predict the most likely location of the offender's residence, place of work and or travel routes based on the locations they've chosen to commit their crimes in. The idea behind geographic profiling is based on two main principles. The first is distance decay, meaning that most crimes are likely to be committed near to the offender's residence in an area that they are familiar with, and as you increase the distance from their crimes, the probability that the offender resides there also reduces. The second principle is that there's a buffer zone around the offender's residence. This area is likely to be avoided as a means to protect their anonymity and criminal behaviour. A geographic profile aims to determine the area in between these two spaces that has the highest mathematical probability of the offender residing nearby. Geographic profiling wouldn't be applicable to all criminals or for all crimes. The target of a geographic profile has to be a repeat offender, engaging in multiple violent offences such as murder, rape and serious assaults, or property crimes like burglary and arson. Since its initial conception, Dr Rosmo has applied geographic profiling to many other fields, including investigating the hunting patterns of great white sharks off of Africa, the foraging behaviour of bats and bumblebees, and to track invasive species of algae in the Mediterranean Sea. But geographic profiling can't help solve a criminal case on its own, nor can it identify a specific individual as the offender. Instead, it uses a combination of environmental criminology theory, mathematics, and offender spatial awareness to give law enforcement an indication of where they should focus their attention and resources in order to have the highest chance of catching the offender. So, how exactly would a crime analyst generate a geographic profile? Well, investigators would have needed to have collected a sufficient amount of information beforehand, since the geographic profile that gets generated is only as good as the information that goes into it. The information would ideally include a chronological list of the offences that are believed to be linked, any and all locations related to the crimes, including the location of where they encountered the victim, where the victim was dumped or released, and the direction the offender travelled in. Also, any crime scene pictures, witness statements, and a psychological profile if one is available. The geographic profiler would also compile information on local crime statistics, the local demographics, and even study all the local zoning and traffic route maps. All of this information would then be input into a computer software program such as Dragnet or Crimestat. Using a patented mathematical algorithm, the software is able to generate a probability surface for the map that works within the confines of the buffer zone and the distance decay. The three-dimensional model of the target location area that is generated looks similar to a topographic map which show ground elevation, because of the way it's colour-coded. But for this map, the different colours are used to represent the probability of where the offender might reside. For example, the colour red might signify the highest probability, while the colour green might represent the lowest. The police can then use this map and use the probability scale to know where to concentrate most of their efforts and resources in order to apprehend the offender. Let's look at an example of how geographic profiling helped the police to solve a series of attacks in the UK. Between 1982 and 1995, there were a series of disturbing assaults committed against women in Leeds, Bradford and Nottingham. In December 1982, 
a woman sitting alone in her car in a Bradford car park was assaulted and raped at knife point by an unknown offender. She reported her attack to the police, but unfortunately the investigation went nowhere. Just one month later, in January 1983, a 26-year-old woman had been in her car in the car park of a hospital in Leeds when a man forced himself into her car and quickly drove them both away. The woman was raped and threatened by her attacker before being gagged and bound with cables and dumped into the freezing cold Leeds and Liverpool Canal. Incredibly, the woman was able to struggle out of her restraints and swim to safety, where she then reported the incident to the West Yorkshire Police. The police eventually linked the two attacks and launched a huge investigation, knocking on over 14,000 front doors in the local area. Frustratingly, the police didn't do a very good job investigating, and they even lost a sketch of the attacker that the first victim had produced. They reportedly missed important leads, and when it looked unlikely that they would be able to identify the unknown offender, the numerous swabs and other evidence that had been collected was simply thrown away. The offender carried on attacking women over the next few years in his usual style, approaching women who were alone in their cars, driving them away, threatening them, and eventually raping and sexually assaulting them. While there was a bit of a lull from 1987 where the attacks seemed to slow down, it appeared the offender was not finished terrorising women. In 1990, a 23-year-old woman from Nottingham was abducted and brutally raped. The attacker then attempted to burn her to death, but luckily, these attempts were unsuccessful. The police collected as much evidence as they could, but it failed to help progress the investigation. Then, in July 1995, another young woman was brutally attacked while parking her car in a multi-storey car park in Leeds. A recreation of this incident was later shown during an appeal for help on Crime Watch in June of 1997. Now 1995 and back to Leeds. I was completing my dissertation and visited the university library. I worked until about... 3.30. I walked down to Morrison's buying some shopping and walked back to the multi-storey on, on Woodhouse Lane. The car was quite warm so I decided to let some air circulate. I've got a knife. He gave me Don't no time to shut the driver's the door. Are after me. This time he put a substance on the woman's eyes to blind her temporarily. He drove her to the outskirts of the city, sexually assaulted her and then drove back again. And once more, he left his victim by the Leeds Canal on Globe Road, where 12 years previously, he tried to kill someone. Eventually, he got out of the car. Then, I rubbed my eyes against the corner of the seat. As we said, a hugely important inquiry combining three forces and the hunt is being coordinated by Assistant Chief Constable Lloyd Clark of West Yorkshire Police. Now, these attacks go back 15 years. The last one was two years ago. Why now are you appealing, appealing in such a high-profile way for help? Well, we now know a lot about this man and we believe that this man will have committed other offences that might not have been reported to the police. I believe that this man has approached women, either in street parking or in car parks, that he might have attacked them, he might even ab have abducted and raped other women who have not reported it to the police. We have special trained police officers and we have non-police rape counsellors who can take those calls tonight. So if you think you've been attacked or raped by this man, we need them to ring tonight. Absolutely. We want as much information as you possibly can have on this man. Yes. Now, the five that we know of, the five women who have been attacked, they've given very good descriptions of him. Of course, his description has changed, his appearance has changed over the years. Yes, in, in 1997, we know this man is at least 35 years of age, probably older, he may be in his early 50s. He's of medium build, of medium height, 5'10 to 6'2", and we know that at the times of the offences, he had dirty blonde, 
neck or collar length hair. But more interesting is his accent. It's a discernible accident, e accent and it's been described as Scottish. Mm. Now we know he's set to his victims, lass and lassie. For example, no fast moves lassie. And we also know that he's emphasised his commands by do you hear me, do you hear me? You're getting on my nerves, do you hear me? Now we believe that those characteristics with the artist's impression might jog someone's memory. Somebody knows him, please name him for us. Nine years elapsed between some attacks, didn't they? I mean, 84, then you didn't hear of him again until 93. Where could he have been in that time? Yes, that's right. A lot of explanations, but it's very possible he was in prison, perhaps serving a long prison sentence, for other than sexual offences. We know this man is a thief, he steals things, we know he steals cars. So prison officers, other members, probation officers, other members of the judicial system who he may have come into contact, if they think they know him, we need them to ring us and name him, please. During the attack in 1995, the unknown offender had struggled with his victim, causing him to cut himself and leave traces of his blood in the victim's car and a partial fingerprint. Not long after, forensic scientists were able to confirm that the blood from the car in Leeds positively matched the DNA from a semen sample that had been collected following the rape and attempted murder in Nottingham. The two offences were officially linked, and finally, the two police forces began to share information and work together, forming what later became known as Operation Lynx, the largest manhunt since the search for the Yorkshire Ripper. With the introduction of a formal inquiry, more officers and detectives were able to become involved and expand their searches. Because most of the attacks happened in and around Leeds, the police believed it was highly likely that the offender resided in the area, but since it's a huge city filled with millions of people, they needed more to go on. With help from the National Crime Agency, a psychological profile of the offender was created, as well as the geographic profile. Due to the vast geographic spread of the offences that occurred over a period of years, the geographic profile was unable to point to a specific street or area and instead identified geographic neighbourhoods where the offender most likely resided. Working on the theory that the offender could very well be known to the police and have a criminal record, detectives conducted examinations of fingerprint records in the two police stations that happened to be located in the middle of the geographic neighbourhoods identified by the profile. After 940 hours of manually searching through over 7,000 fingerprints, the partial print collected from the crime scene was officially matched to a criminal record at Milgarth Police Station, finally identifying Clive Barwell as the offender. Once his DNA was tested against the semen found at one of the rapes and there was a positive match, he was arrested and charged. Detectives later found that Barwell had lived at two addresses throughout his years of offending, and both addresses were located within the neighbourhoods identified by the geographic profile. His main residence was in Killingbeck, and his mother, who he sometimes stayed with, resided in Milgarth. Clive Barwell appeared on the surface to be a fairly normal guy, a father of four who worked as a delivery driver, and although he had been married three times, none of his ex-partners had any suspicions that he was a violent sexual offender. It was also uncovered that in 1987, Barwell had been sentenced to 16 years in prison for armed robbery, which was the reason that the attacks had slowed down. Frustratingly, Barwell was not connected to the sexual offences he had committed prior to this time, and he only served four years of his sentence before he was somehow transferred to an open prison. He was able to present himself as a model prisoner in order to get special privileges such as day release, which gave him the opportunity to continue attacking and violating women. In 1999, Clive Barwell pled guilty to three rapes, four kidnappings, one attempted murder and various other assault charges. He was sentenced to eight life sentences and will likely never be released from prison. It's clear that the police fumbled the early stages of the investigation 
and really struggled to connect the attacks due to the different locations they occurred in. But once the geographic profile was created, it gave investigators the ability to focus in on particular areas of interest and give the operation more momentum. Clive Barwell is a very dangerous man who was experienced at avoiding capture and had the ability to manipulate the people around him. It's not unrealistic to assume that Barwell would have continued his relentless attacks on women with escalating violence. An important question to consider would be whether the police would have ever been able to identify their suspect without the crucial information that the geographic profile provided.